and welcome to Victory On Demand. We hope that this service you're about to watch helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in some way that helps you take your next step. We wanna connect with you. We know that life is busy and that you may be watching this on a Tuesday afternoon or maybe a Saturday morning or some other day of the week that isn't Sunday. And that's the beauty of On Demand and that God can use any of the other 167 hours of the week to connect us back to Him. But we want to be able to include you as part of our church family and to help you take your next step wherever that may be. Let us know that you're here by clicking on one of the buttons that's popping up on your screen right now. Now, no matter who you are, where you are, or what you're struggling with, our goal is to equip you with a new perspective that you'll hopefully be able to use in order to live life in a better way. And we pray that as you live out God's word, that you would truly experience something more, something better. If you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. We're so glad that you've chosen to be a part of Victory today, and we hope that you enjoy our service. Good morning, Victory. How are we feeling this morning? Are we ready to worship the King? Let's all stand and sing.
Hey everybody, we've got Addison Sandals and her dad, who was just recently baptized on Easter, and we are gonna make a decision today. You ready? All right, will you repeat after me? I believe, I believe that, Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Is the Son of the living God. And I accept Him. And I accept Him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. All right, Addison, because of your confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. daughter Madison and her mom Candace and uh, she's gonna be baptizing her mom today um, will you repeat after me <clears throat> I believe I believe that Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God is the son of the living God and I accept him and I accept him as my Lord and my Savior as my Lord and my Savior because of your confession of faith I now baptize you she now baptizes you <laughs> in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is Candace's other daughter, um, Annabelle. And she has made the same decision today. She's also gonna be baptized by her sister, Madison. Will you repeat after me? I believe, I believe. that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Living God, and I accept Him as my Lord and my Savior. Because of your confession of faith, Madison will now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. Step into this time of communion. I just want us to uh, reflect on the truth in the songs that we just sang. We are reminded that God is our He's our guiding light in times of doubt or uncertainty, or when the stress and the anxiety just just feels like at, at an all-time high. We can still look to our Father. We can still look to the King of Kings, the One who is and is to come, the One who sits high on His throne, the One who is worthy of our praise and gets all the glory and all the honor. Communion is just one of my favorite parts to our service. It's a time of uh, unity as we believers are together to partake and acknowledge that we are all part of God's family. It also just reminds us that we aren't alone in our walk with Christ. We can support and encourage each other. And by doing that, it reflects the love of Christ in our community. So as we partake this morning, let's just remember the bread that was broken for us and the cup that represents his blood that was poured out for us in remembrance of him so let's come with open hearts this morning that are just full of gratitude for his sacrifice and the hope that we have in him let's partake this morning
up as we uh, finish worshiping this morning. Part, church. 
church with everything that we have. guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Speaking of Jesus, we have the incredible opportunity to speak Jesus into the next generation. You know, I've been here a number of years and talked to many of you adults about uh, what it would look like to get involved with helping out the next gen to win in our student ministries. And, uh, and uh, we have great leaders that are there, but I also, I often hear people say, oh man, that I, I could never work with, that's, that's, that's a, a lot of personality. That's a, that takes a special person, you know, and I get it. I get it. But one of the ways that we can all help is to pray over the next generation, to pray and speak Jesus into their lives in whatever way that we can. You know, each and every summer, we, we have the incredible opportunity to go to things like camp, CIY, which is a conference for our high school students. And, uh, and each year, students make the awesome decision to, to give their lives to Jesus for the first time, to come back to Jesus if they've kind of wandered, or, or to maybe even go into full-time ministry, or whatever they want to do in their life to know that I want to do kingdom work and move in my community no matter where I end up and no matter what I'm doing. And as a church, and as a church leader, we never want students to, that flame to die out, or for them to think, well, maybe, was that real? Was, was God really speaking to me that week? And so out there in, in the lobby, I've got a table of some tokens. We've been doing this all morning and we got some for CIY Move and we got some for camp, which starts today for our students over at Camp Allendale. And on the back of each of those is a name of a student who is going or who has gone to CIY in the last couple of weeks. And we want every student to be prayed for by a member of our church. We want every student to have somebody speaking Jesus into their lives, even if they don't know who it is. And so uh, we have a few of those left and I would love before you leave today for every last one of those names to be taken and claimed for somebody to be praying for them, that God will move in their life, that they would feel the spirit prompting them to maybe a next step, whatever that may be, that they would build relationships this week that are lifelong, that they would build relationships with their peers. You know, the statistics say this is the loneliest generation. Our students are in desperate need for community and weeks like this provide the perfect opportunity for them to connect with each other and connect with grounded adults in their life speaking truth into them and walking alongside them. So I would encourage you to, to exponentially increase their efforts through prayer this week. Grab a name of a student who's, who's either going to camp this week or who has gone to CIY in the last couple weeks and make sure that they are prayed for every single day. That will shake the ground and move the kingdom further than you can possibly imagine. As someone who's been on these trips multiple times, and, and you can ask any of our other adult leaders who have gone, these weeks are truly life-changing. And as a church, we want to set up the next generation to win with each other in their relationships and vertically with their relationship with Jesus. So uh, if you would do that, and even if you don't grab a name, if they're all gone by the time you get out there, which I fully expect by the time that everybody leaves today for all of these to be gone, then Pray for those that you know are going, or even if you don't know those who are going, just pray in general for the leaders, that, that they would be able to fight through the sleep deprivation, that they would be able to have the patience, that they would be able to take it, the opportunity to, in the moments that God provides in order to, to speak life into these students who desperately need hope and encouragement. 
you know, living as a Christian is tough and doing so at that age is incredibly tough as well for its own reasons. So praying is, is an amazing thing that you can do. And uh, so let me pray right now. And then I just encourage you, set a reminder if you're in your phone, if you're, your ADHD brain is gonna make you forget by the time service gets out, to go out there and grab a token, to pray for students. And I'm gonna pray right now and then we'll continue on with our gathering this morning. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for each and every person who's here this morning, for the opportunity we have to gather and uh, to worship your name. I ask that you be with all the students this week and all the kids who are gonna be at camp, that you would, uh, you would be even preparing them, softening their hearts now to hear from your word to be moved by your spirit. And God, I ask that um, this community would be forever changed because of the influence of the next generation, that they would come out of weeks like this, they would come out of environments like ours, they would come out of these experiences closer to you, closer with each other, and on fire to move, being led by your spirit. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we pray, amen. World News Today. And only you can decide what you want what you want this country to be, what you want to do with the future. Vote like your whole world depended on it. Voters should not be forced to go to the polls with their fingers crossed. They understand what peace demands. What America needs are leaders to match the greatness of her people. Campaign appearances are getting closer and closer together as each candidate tries to get in his best shot. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. It's going to get dirtier in these last few days. No apologies, no regrets. We will not be coerced. We will not tolerate being pushed around. As we start off our time together, I think it's appropriate for me to just say, I love America. I love America. I don't think we get everything right all of the time. In fact, if you look around our country, it's really not hard to find a lot that we still get wrong. But I believe that you and I are living in the greatest country to ever exist. The hope, the opportunity, the genuine care that we can express as a nation is unbelievable. And I believe this because at one time we we're one nation under God. In 248 years, uh, that's the, the how old we are. A lot has happened. There's been a lot over the years to be divided about, and it seems like elections only fuel the divide, fuel the accusations, fuel the hate. The elections actually seem to highlight some of the worst parts of America. I mean, just turn on your TV, watch the news, open up social media, or God forbid, watch a debate. Anybody do that? I mean, the hope of America and the future of America seems dim. In fact, our options are so bad that there's a teacher, an army veteran from Texas. Have you heard about this guy? He's running for president. He legally changed his name to literally anybody else. True story. So when Texans go to vote, they have three choices, Biden, and Trump, and literally anybody else. So what's a Jesus follower supposed to do? Like, how's a Jesus follower supposed to vote? How can Jesus followers avoid the election infection? Just so you're aware, today's message is for the Jesus follower. So if you don't follow Jesus, you don't have to do any of this, but I do hope it gives you some perspective. But if you are a Jesus follower, what I wanna challenge you to do is something that Jesus followers have been challenged to do from the very beginning. I just wanna challenge you to put your faith over your politics. To put your faith over your politics, to which you say, Josh, why would I do that? Well, let me just say it this way. No Jesus follower believes that when they die, heaven is Washington, D.C. Like, no, nobody's thinking, hey, when I die, my eternal destination is gonna be Washington, D.C. Like, no one's hoping for that. So, so as a Jesus follower, you and I need to make decisions through the lens of, of heaven. So I just wanna challenge you to put your faith over your, your politics. In other words, I want you to look at the world. I want you to make decisions in your life through the filter of your faith first. Meaning that as you and I approach November 5th, you are a Jesus follower first and a Republican second. You're a Jesus follower first and a Democrat second. You're a Jesus follower first and Libertarian or Independent second. And so that would mean that everyone who follows Jesus sees the world, makes decisions, cares about, interacts with people who disagree with them, even votes 
through the lens of our faith first. So on our nation's journey towards November 5th, what we share, what we post on social media, the arguments that we might have at work or at our family gatherings, I just want to challenge all of us through all of that to put our faith over our politics, to which some of you are thinking, Josh, I am so glad you're talking about this because that's what I'm doing. That's what, I wish everyone would vote like me, post like me, think like me. Just, I'm so glad you're talking about this because those ignorant people need to hear this. I mean, how could anyone in their right mind follow Jesus and not be a Republican? I mean, the reason I'm a Republican is because I'm a, a Christian. Just, don't you know that God is always on the right? And Jesus up in heaven, he's at the right hand of the Father. I mean, God and Jesus have to be Republicans. They're always right. And it's hard to, it's not hard to twist scripture to fit our viewpoint, is it? I mean, there's even biblical evidence that Jesus cares for Republicans. Remember, Jesus called Matthew to be his follower, and Matthew was a tax collector. A tax collector, another word for tax collector, is publican. It's like, Republican? Yeah. I mean, it's almost right there in the Bible, Josh. And, and if that wasn't enough, when Jesus goes to Matthew's house and all of the Pharisees are hanging out, Jesus makes this statement. He says, it, it, it's, it's right there in the text. Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the, the sick. And I've not come to call the, the right, right, but sinners to repentance. So Josh, it's like right there, almost kind of in the text. Uh, We're right. and There's a bunch of sinners. So put my faith over my politics all day, every day. I'm right. I'm a Republican. I mean, we need this country. We need to save this country from those sinners. Now, if you're a Democrat, you're thinking, are you kidding me? Right? Jesus was a healthcare dispensing machine. Everywhere he went, he gave out free healthcare. He, he never turned anyone away and he never charged. Josh, Jesus is always challenging the rich, rich on their obligation to the poor and humanitarian aid. Oh my gosh, Jesus gave out humanitarian aid everywhere he went. Did you read about the feeding of the 5,000? It's in all four gospels. Not only Josh, if you read the New Testament, you know this, God's love has no borders. So put your faith over your politics all day, every day. Uh, just can it be any more obvious? Jesus was clearly a Democrat. And if you're a libertarian, you're like, really? I mean, I know the most famous verse is John three sixteen, but another famous verse people quote all the time is you will know the truth and the truth will set you what? Free as in liberated, right? Not only that, but in 1 Thessalonians, it says you should mind your own business. It's like right there in the Bible. So put my faith over my politics all day, every day, right? God's clearly a libertarian, right? Have I twisted enough scripture? Have I offended enough people? Is everyone a little uncomfortable about what I might say next? Good, good. Now, historically speaking, just the, the, the third party has never produced a president. And not only that, but you guys probably know this, that the Democrat Party and the Republican parties have not always stood for the same things that they do today. So in fact, historically speaking, America's two dominant parties have flipped ideologies since they were founded. In fact, the Democrat Party was founded in 1828 and the Republican Party was founded in 1854. And in its early years, the Republican Party was considered, considered liberal and progressive, while the Democrats were known for their staunch conservatism. I mean, and check, check this out. This is like a real Instagram infographic. That it's, it's in your notes, it's on your app. But over time, and I know this oversimplifies it, but over time, historically speaking, so not my opinion, historically speaking, they've flipped sides. Now, it didn't, the changes didn't happen overnight. Instead, it was a steady, sh- sl- slow changes were the policies that have caused the great switch. In fact, at one time, Democrats were known for small government, fiscal conservative, and they were pro-slavery. While the Republicans at one point were known for high taxes, big government, progressive, and, and government spending on social issues. But culture had changed. And over time, the Democrat Party began to know, be known for pro-expansion of government, pro-government spending, and pro-civil rights, where the Republican Party was wanting to reduce taxes, create smaller government, and cut, or more conservative, and cut spending on, on social issues. And all of that to say that as we start to think about November 5th, even the parties that have had power in America, they, they've flipped sides. 
that they flip sides. So meaning, depending on when you were born, you might be a strong supporter of the opposite party that you support today. It's just possible. And all of that should remind us that if our faith is in our politics, it is shaky ground. It, it changes, it, it's shifting. Not only that, but no political party is completely aligned with Jesus. Like you understand that, right? No political party is completely aligned with Jesus. Why? It's because Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. And so historically speaking, that's what made the Jesus followers a threat because they pledged their allegiance not to a country. They bowed their knee. They leveraged their lives. They were willing to sacrifice everything to follow a crucified king. So historically speaking, the reason the Roman government was so hostile towards Christianity was not because Christianity was a religion. In fact, in Rome, they had hundreds of gods. They had all kinds of religions. And the reason the Romans were hostile to the Jesus followers as they spread all over the Roman Empire is because in the first century, Christianity was not a religious term. It was a political term. In fact, in Rome in the first century, the reason Jesus followers were persecuted and the reason Jesus followers like you and I were executed was because of their, not because of their religious beliefs, but because of their political beliefs. And no, it was not Republican and Democrat. These first followers of Jesus were persecuted because they pledged their allegiance not to a country. They were willing to sacrifice everything to follow their crucified king. In the beginning, Christianity was a political term because the kingdom of God is political, but not in the way that we might think. So if you follow Jesus, that means that you and I wake up every day knowing. We, we live every day knowing. We make every decision knowing. I, I, I support a new king. He's the Lord of my life. My life is not my own. Meaning Jesus followers believe the White House. The White House is not heaven. And the president is not God. Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. And this might shock you, but, but God doesn't stand for our national anthem. He's a king of a better kingdom, an enduring kingdom. And those first followers of Jesus were persecuted because they were willing to pledge their allegiance not to a country, but to this crucified king. In fact, when you read the New Testament, you discover Jesus claimed the right to rule over every one of our lives as a king. Now, this concept seems so lost on so many of us when we sit in church. And when we go to church, we think, it's, oh, this is all about religion. We sit in church, we think we try to gauge our own personal morality. But every Christmas, when you and I read the, the birth narrative in Luke chapter one, we, we've been reading uh, Luke this, this week uh, in the New Testament reading plan. Hopefully you're doing that. We just finished week 27. If you want to start week 28 this week. But, but Luke one was written around five BC when we read a king is born. And every Christmas, we normally skim over it, but, but this is how Luke records it. He says, do not be afraid, Mary. God is very pleased with you. You'll become pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you must call him Jesus, which is the English name of the Latin name of the Greek name that came from the Hebrew name, Yeshua. It's a name I like. It means Joshua or leader or warrior. So, so in the manger is a leader, in the manger is a warrior. And the angel goes on to say, he will be called, uh, he'll be called the son of the most high God. So this is like royal language. This is like a royal title. He will be the son of the supreme king of the universe. And if there was any doubt about his royalty, listen to this next part. He says, the, the Lord God will make him a what? A king as his ancestor David was, that's Israel's second king, and he will be the king of the descendants of Jacob for how long? Forever. And then the angel makes this promise, his kingdom will never end. Now, in the Greek text, it comes across a little bit stronger than that. It literally reads a little bit something like this, and of his kingdom, there shall not be an end. Your son will always be a king. He, he will always have a kingdom. Now, if you follow Jesus, the fact that Jesus will always be a king should give you and I confidence. It should give us hope. It should give us a firm foundation. So that means that even though our options really are bad here on earth um, when it comes to Republicans or Democrats, uh, the, right? They, they even change their positions and their opinions, but our king never changes. 
His commands never change. His promises never change. His grace never change. His rule never fails. And so that should give us confidence to follow him even when it's difficult. Now, this might surprise you, but when you read the New Testament, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, it's both are referring to the, the exact same thing. They're all over the place. The kingdom of God refer, occurs 68 times in the New Testament, and the kingdom of heaven occurs 32 times in the book of Matthew alone. The kingdom of God is the centerpiece of Jesus' teaching. And so this is so different from how we think, because when you and I think about God, we think about what? Religion. When we think about God, we think about morality. When we think about God, we think about the church. But Jesus came to show us who God is and what God is like. And Jesus would tell you, oh, you're just not seeing clearly. Because then when Jesus talks about God, he uses the idea of a, of a kingdom. That Jesus came to establish an other's first kingdom, a kingdom of conscience, a kingdom of heart, a kingdom that would reign over every language, every nation, every generation forever. And so much of America has just been lulled to sleep. But you need to know from the very beginning of Christianity, this was not about a religion. This was about a revolution for the hearts and the minds of his followers in fact, in a town about 300 miles north from Jerusalem in Antioch, one of the three largest, wealthiest cities in the Roman Empire at the time, in the city of Antioch, a new term was being coined by people to describe something that was happening in their city. It was a response to this new political movement. The Greeks and the Romans were choosing to follow and swear their allegiance to a brand new king. They referred to him as the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. My translation, God's final king. And that upset the Roman Empire because this king uh, they, they were swearing their allegiance to had been crucified about 10 years earlier, meaning that they didn't just believe he was a king, but because of the eyewitness testimony of the resurrection, they actually believed that he was a God. Now, it's so important for us to understand in the first century, the secular and the spiritual were two completely different realms. They, they kept the separation of religion and, and life, and so they actually believed that the gods, they didn't care how you behaved. So you could go to church and hook up with whoever you want. You could go to church and gossip about whoever you want. You could go to church and have sex with whoever you want. Men, women, relatives, siblings, but I didn't care. Live however you want. Just ask for forgiveness later. See, Rome didn't care who you worship. You could worship your ancestors. You could worship tribal deities. You could worship statues. You could worship Poseidon. You could worship Zeus and sing songs. Sing, sing all day <laughs> to whoever you want. In fact, their motto in Rome went a little something like this, to all the people in the empire, worship your gods, but obey Caesar. Worship your gods. I don't care who you sing songs to. I don't care who you worship. I don't care who you sacrifice to or what their names are. Worship your gods. But at the end of the day, you better swear your allegiance to Caesar. Obey Caesar. But in Antioch, in Antioch, there's this group of Greeks and Romans where the divine and the secular just collided in the person of a Jewish rabbi. Here's the thing that we just can't miss. The citizens of Antioch were not changing religions. The citizens of Antioch were changing their allegiance. They swore their allegiance. They were willing to give their lives. They were willing to live under the authority of this crucified king. So this was not a religion. This was a revolution that invited them to live in a way that seemed upside down to the rest of the world because their king said things like this. I tell you to love your enemies. Love the people who disagree with you. I want you to love the people who mistreat you. I want you to love your enemies. And then I want you to do more than that. I want you to pray for those who persecute you. Who does that? Our king says things like, sacrifice your money. Why? To care for other image bearers of God. Who, who would do that? Our king says things like, you, you shouldn't identify as anything more than you submit and follow and identify as being a son or daughter of a crucified king. I'm telling you, from the very beginning, Jesus demanded control over their sexuality, their money, their very life. This was about their whole lives. This was about the, the whole person. Not only that, Jesus commanded that every beating heart was created in the image of God. So that meant his followers, you were to care for, sacrifice, serve, and be generous towards every other person. 
We're supposed to love one another. And it so disrupted their culture. It so disrupted their political system from the very beginning. These Jesus followers in that culture stood out because they were willing to bind themselves to an oath to not commit fraud or theft or adultery. They would bind themselves to this oath to carry one another's burdens. They would bind themselves to an oath. I'm gonna forgive you and I'm gonna love you, even the people who've harmed me or offended me. They made it a priority to gather with other Jesus followers the first day of every week. And their kids, their kids knew, hey, in this house, Jesus is a priority every day, every week, every Sunday. And these Jesus followers, they didn't care who ran the government. It didn't enrage them when a bad king reigned. What? What did it do? It reminded them, this world is not their home. That wasn't their king. I'm telling you, for the first followers of Jesus, this was not a religion, it was a revolution. In fact, I believe that if the Jesus you know hasn't changed your life yet, you've just met religion, not Jesus. If the Jesus you know about hasn't changed your life yet, you've just met religion. I don't think you've met Jesus. Because from the very beginning, this was not a religion, it was a revolution. Now, part of the problem is, what do you call these people? Like they called themselves disciples or followers of the way, but, but Luke, who wrote, the historian who wrote Luke and the book of Acts, he, he says that it was in this city, it says in Antioch, they were finally given a name. It says the disciples were accused of being what? Christians. They were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, this is important. They weren't branded Christians to differentiate themselves from other religious people of the day, the, the Zeusians or the Jupiterians. I made those up. Like, they didn't even have those terms, right? This was clearly used to describe someone who followed a political party because in the first century, you could be called a Caesarian, a follower of Julius Caesar, or a Herodian, a follower of Herod, or a Christian, a follower of Christ, God's final king. In fact, to be a Christian in the Roman Empire would eventually become a crime. Not because of what you believed, not because of where you went to church, because being a Jesus follower was seen as anti-Roman. From the very beginning, this was not a religion. It was a revolution. Because when a king is born, when a king is born, people have to choose. When a king is born, people have to choose. And Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. So if you follow Jesus, I just want to challenge you. Put your faith over your politics. I'm challenging you with your decisions with your interactions with others, when your care, how you respond, with your vote, just answer the question, is Jesus my king? Is Jesus my king? Is Jesus my king? See, I have a feeling this election cycle is gonna feel even more toxic and hopeless. I, I think this thing is just ramping up and it's gonna get divisive. And as a Jesus follower, that should not enrage us. It should remind us this world is not our home. Now, I don't normally do this, but I'm just gonna give you some advice in this season. I normally stay away from this. I'm gonna give you some voting practices that I would give to my kids. So do with this whatever you want. I've got five voters coming to my house. So because I care about you, I just, I'm just gonna share with you. So I, number one, pray and invite God into the process. As we point our lives till November 5th, I want you to pray for God's wisdom, pray for God's will over my will, pray for God to change my mind if needed, invite God in the process, and then ask him to give me peace with whatever the result is, believing God can use whoever's in the office. Pray and invite God in the process. Number, number two, do your research. Acknowledge the complex issues cannot fairly be reduced to a five-second soundbite, TikTok clip, or Instagram reel. I right, realize sometimes the issues are way more complex. And so that means that as Jesus followers, we can't sit back. We actually have to do some homework. We need to do our research. Number three, as a Jesus follower, we must vote for the vulnerable. All kinds, everyone, anyone who is vulnerable. As, as Christians, we're called to stand up for the vulnerable, to be a voice for the voiceless. Every beating heart matters to God. Jesus was willing to, to die for every person you ever meet. He, he so loves them. So you and I should be concerned with the voiceless. We need to stand for truth, but hold on to grace and vote for the vulnerable. No, number four, vote for policies over politicians. Making God's word my primary voting guide. What policies most closely align with the New Testament? Policies over politicians. Get this, only Jesus is perfect. 
Meaning, and I hope this doesn't shock you, this season we have no perfect candidates. So vote for policies over politicians. Number five, have perspective. Remember, God is in control. And God has a track record. We can look throughout history. If the candidate who wins is immoral or incompetent, historically speaking, it's not the end of the world. I mean, just, just read history. God has used the wicked and the incompetent to accomplish his eternal plan. So just have some perspective on the kingdom you really are allegiant to. See, if you are allegiant to the kingdom of America more than the kingdom of God, that's a problem. This world is not your home. I know there's a lot of unknown. I know there's a lot to be unsure of. I don't know what's next. But the nail scarred resurrected feet of my king repeatedly reminds me, fear not. Fear not. And we can walk in confidence, but we can only do that when we have the perspective of who's in control. Finally, re remember your witness. I love this country, and I really do believe that this election is important. I do but some of you are losing your eternal perspective. You're willing to risk the eternal impact over a four-year presidency. To which you say, Josh, you're blowing this out of proportion. No, I'm not. Four years ago, I saw your post on social media and I had to talk with the people who were leaving our church because of it. So I'm not saying don't vote and I'm not saying don't have an opinion and I'm not saying have good conversations with people. I'm just saying stop posting angry memes or starting arguments on social media. It doesn't work. I've read thousands of angry political posts from both sides. Do you know what I've never read? Good point. I've changed my mind. Not once. <laughs> I'll challenge you. If you're doing all of that, do it as if Jesus is your king first. I mean, are, are, you, are you doing all of that because you're worried about losing the comfort of America or because he's your king? So remember, we're, we're witnesses I just don't want you to lose your eternal impact by jumping into a toxic debate to broadcast your opinion over a four-year presidency. See, I, I love America. And one of the things I love about America is simply this. My opinion doesn't count. My vote does. My, my opinion, it doesn't count. But because of the, so, the sacrifices of so many men and women in our military, my vote actually does. So why would I give up my eternal influence with the people who, who, who just want to argue with me when, when they can't take my vote away from me? I mean, how tragic would it be for me to burn a bridge of influence with my friends or my family members or my loved ones or my coworkers? How tragic would it be to burn a bridge of my influence over something that gets divisive and toxic every four years anyway? I mean, think about it this way. You don't even know who the 21st president is. And eternally... It probably doesn't even matter. If you're a Jesus follower, here's what you believe. This is a rescue mission. And so that means that you and I should never give up our influence unnecessarily. So let me just say it this way. If people avoid you because of Jesus, that's expected. <laughs> but if people avoid Jesus because of you, that's a problem. I mean, just, is this important? I want you to get this. If people avoid you because of Jesus, he says that his word, that should be expected. But if people avoid Jesus because of you, that's a problem. This is a rescue mission. Jesus came to save us from this political mess. So please, just remember your witness. In fact, and this is important. No matter who wins November 5th, no matter who wins November 5th, Jesus' followers are commanded. That all of you must obey those who rule over you. There are no authorities except the ones that who? God has chosen. Those who now rule over you have been chosen by, by, by God. Now remember, the Bible wasn't written to you. It was written for you. But it was actually written to people. This part was li living in Rome during the time of Nero. To which you say, Josh, you mean the guy killing Christians? Yeah. Josh, you mean the guy who murdered Paul? Yeah. And Paul says, hey, everyone, you know what that means in the Greek? Everyone. All kinds, every person, everyone must submit to the governing authorities as long as it doesn't conflict with scripture. And Paul wrote that to the Romans. You know who the chief persecutor of the Christians was in that time? The Romans. Do you know who would murder his friend Peter and ultimately himself, Paul? The Romans. But historically speaking, this is the way forward. In fact, if you and I were to go visit Rome right now, do you know what you would see? Crosses everywhere. 
Crustles everywhere, churches everywhere. In fact, so, for so many, Rome is central to their faith and people all over the world will name their kids Peter and Paul and they'll name their dog Nero. <laughs> Paul saw that it was part of a larger plan and so he says, hey, everyone, everyone must submit to the governing authorities for all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by who? God, that's what Jesus followers believe. So if you're a Jesus follower, you have to have an eternal perspective. See, God's word doesn't say he will establish an earthly government that will lead to everlasting peace. No government is the hope of the world. Jesus is. Jesus is. And just so you know, I have an opinion who I think should be president. And I will have conversations with people I think disagree with me. And like you, I will probably be frustrated out of my mind by their, my interactions with people. But do you know what Jesus followers do? They follow Jesus. And Jesus died for his enemies. Jesus loved his enemies. In fact, some of his last words, what did Jesus pray? He says, Father, forgive them, they are ignorant. Father, forgive them, they don't understand. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus died for his enemies. Jesus prayed for his enemies. And Jesus loved his enemies. That's my king. My king didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. So this election season, I just have to ask, is he your king? Is he your king? And if he is, as we point our lives towards November 5th, I just want to challenge you. If he is, just put your faith over your politics. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for allowing us to live in a country where we can talk about this without bloodshed. And Father, just thank you for allowing us to have the opportunity to, to, to steward this republic, for placing us in a country where our opinion doesn't matter, but our vote actually does. So help us to get this right. Help us to represent you well and help us to trust you with our future. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Thank you so much for joining us for Victory On Demand. Here at Victory, we believe that we all have a next step, and we pray that God uses what you've experienced here today to stir something in your life and to lead you to the next step in your faith journey, whatever that may be. If you'd like to talk to someone about taking your next step, please let us know by clicking the button that's popping up on your screen right now. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given to us. We celebrate generosity in the work that God does through our sacrificial giving in our community and around the world. If your experience today has helped you or blessed you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God by going to victorycc.life slash give. Again, if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. Remember, here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. We'll see you next time.